Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechai, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. The prophets didn't just write these books for, for something to do. It says that the prophets cried to the people to turn back to God, to turn from your evil doings. But there's a common message throughout the Old Testament. And that is, after repeated warnings and God calling the people back and calling the people back, they did not hear nor hearken unto me, says the Lord. We're going to see something in here in Zechariah. And I guess I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's very probable that our mission, our, our primary mission at first during that thousand years, is we're going to kind of be invisible doing what the angels do now. Making the kingdom work. We'll have the authority, we'll have the power, we'll have certain um, areas that we're responsible for to help rule and reign, but I don't see us sitting on physical thrones. We, we're not called to be worshipped by anyone. I think we're going to be kind of invisible unless we have to be become visible. You see a lot of um, God talking about the Millennial Kingdom, but he's talking about how he's going to elevate Israel in the time. The spirit world work has to be done by someone, right? Maybe some of the angels are going to go on vacation. Got to make some room for us, right? We see where the former prophets, verse 4, they've cried out saying to return to, to God, but they would never repent from their evil doings. And we saw it in the, in the um, uh, Assyrian captivity. Remember we talked about that? Um, in, um, in 721 B.C., the, there was the ten tr tribes of Israel, and then there were the two tribes of Judah. Originally, they were one nation with 12 tribes. Those ten tribes refused to repent over and over and over. They had wicked kings. We, and then in 721 B.C., Assyria came in and took them and spread them all just throughout the world. And uh, many say that they, they lost their identity, the lost tribes of Israel. Josephus, was a, who was a historian living at the time of Jesus, had written that those ten lost tribes were still lost. They had lost their identity and that they never returned. However, there's evidence that um, there was always a, that there was a remnant of the 12 tribes in Judah. But you would think that Judah as maybe, maybe we could call her the younger sister the older sister being Israel, the 10 tribes and, and they finally reaped their punishment for their wickedness and you would have thought that it would have jarred Judah and they would have said we don't want that to happen to us. But it wasn't not too long after that they went in 587 B.C. In fact, uh, uh, was a siege of Jerusalem. But in 606 B.C., when, uh, when Babylon first came into power, people were already being taken into captivity. And in 587, uh, the temple was destroyed and and there was, the city was destroyed, the walls were destroyed, and, and they, they went into, brought them into Babylon as, as slaves. And <clears throat> that's where we get the book of Daniel from. Book of Daniel, you had, uh, they were eunuchs. You know what eunuchs are, right? If, if you became a eunuch, 
you would not have any sexual desire whatsoever. And so you're, you're in the palace and you can be trusted with the king's wives there, right? Because he doesn't have to worry about you because you can't do anything, right? And you have no desire for it. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were all, they were all eunuchs. They were all brought into the king's court. And, uh, I mean, they were actually treated fairly well. And if you call being thrown into a fiery furnace fairly well. I, but that came, that really, that, you, you all familiar with the book of Daniel where they were thrown in a fiery furnace, but it wasn't really, the king, the king didn't really want to do that to him. The, the, the uh, people around his peers, their peers were jealous of them. Because they worshipped God, that they knew God, and so they they were kind of squealed on them. The inner circle actually set them up. The inner circle, that's right, set them up, and but God delivered them, right? And they ended up getting thrown in the fire. He goes, throw them in. And yeah, and the ones that (laughs) yeah yeah, God will turn it around. That's right. What I love about that fiery furnace, and we're not supposed to be in Babylon, but he throws the three in there, and, and the king said, there's four. There's four. <laughs> Where'd a fourth one come? In fact, uh, uh, I think it was Oral Roberts made that sermon uh, uh, popular about, it's called the fourth man. You may have heard that by other people that kind of clone that sermon for themselves, but who's the fourth man? And, of course, the testimony of King, he looked at him, he says, there's one, he's like the son of God. So he recognized that there's something about this guy. Now, I don't know, was he just physical stature? Did it give it away that the fire was, he, he had an aura around him and the fire couldn't, t- I don't know how he knew this was, you know, the, the son of God standing there in the middle of him. So let's go to, uh, back to Zechariah chapter 1. And verse 5 then. So Zechariah continues. He says, Now your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Well, the answer to the question is, they've been dragged into captivity. Right? They were dragged into Assyrian captivity and then Currently, they were dragged into the Babylon. He says, we're, we're, we far, I mean, we've passed the Assyrian captivity. We're, we're close the, to the, um, the Babylonian capti- captivity here. They're, they're, they're actually going to come back from Babylon, Babylonian captivity. But he says, well, what, what happened? Where, where are your fathers? Where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? He uses that as an illustration to to bring about this truth in verse 6. He says, But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? In other words, didn't what I say was going to happen take hold of them and, and come upon them? Yet they refused to give heed to my commandments. If you look at the nation Israel went in captivity first, 721 B.C., as the older sister, and then you look at Judah as the younger sister, you would have thought that she saw that the judgment came upon her, her older sister, you would have thought that she straightened up and fly right. In fact, you can stretch that out to us today. You would think after seeing what God did to the Jews, the nation of Judah, the nation of Israel, and all the way down through history of mankind and God's dealings, even during the Christian Christian time, how God treated and rewarded the Christians, how He blessed them, and how judgment has come, and how God's hand of judgment has come and come upon many nations. You would think that we would take seriously or take heed of the warnings that are here. Because everything that happened, according to the scripture, everything that happened to them was for examples for us to live right, to give heed, 
But do we? I'm not talking about you individually. I'm, I'm just saying, as a whole, did the church forget that they're supposed to walk the straight and narrow? Yeah. It seems like it, doesn't it? He said, only the ones that walk on the narrow way are going to make it. And God's Spirit says, they don't listen to Moses and they don't listen to the prophets. They would not listen even if somebody rose from the dead. But then something wonderful happened. God gave them somebody that rose from the dead. And they still wouldn't listen. And they still don't listen today. There's a lot of people in the church that are under great delusion. It's getting worse. And it's getting worse every day. Every day. And that just tells me we're getting closer and closer. The reality of the uh, be either hot or cold, but if you be lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. There you go. There you go, right from Laodicea. And that's the dispensation or the age we live in, is the the last of the church ages. There was the seven churches. and there, All those seven churches in Revelation, they're prophetic. And that last church is what... Uh, my brother's talking about about being spit out of the mouth because they're not hot or cold. And again, last week we brought up about the five virgins. Right? Somebody brought up about the five virgins. Five were faithful, five were not. Five made it. I see that as the church waiting for the rapture. I think that the scripture tells us straight out there's at least 50% of the people are not going right there. People that think they're going, a church that thinks they're going. Now, of course, you've got a lot of church members that don't think they're going. <laughs> I don't understand, but why would you want to be in a church and not believe in the catching away? I guess you can only believe what you believe, but when I look in the Bible, it, it's pretty plain. We're leaving. At least I'm leaving. Amen. The sad part is the, thing, the people that think they got fired. Everybody's always looking for the deal. Where can I find the cheapest company or the, the company that will uh, cost me the, the least for fire insurance? And what do you think will happen when your house burns down and you got a real good deal on that insurance premium, but that company is out of business? Right? Yeah, they do go out of business. And they do go out they of business. Or they refuse to pay for one reason or another. Yeah. We have a lot of people trusting in things that aren't true. We have a lot of people that are saying that they have prophetic gifts and they're, they're speaking lies to the people. And why are they taking it hook, line, and sinker? Because they don't know the word. The only way you can know in the last days what's of God and what's not of God is if you're familiar with the words of God. A lot of corruption in the new translation, so be careful. So verse 7, chapter 1, verse 7. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Sibet, in the second year of Darius. Now this second year of Darius, and you see it in Zechariah 1.1 1, 1 also. Actually it says, in the eighth month in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord to Zechariah. So this is the time period of, the, of these visions that Zechariah gets in these words that he begins receiving uh, from God, 520 B.C. I don't think it's anyone is debating that year because we know historically what was the second year of Darius. And that happened to be 520 B.C. So just for your own information there. So upon the 4th and 20th day of the 11th month, which is the month Sebet, in the second year of Darius, which we just said was 520 B.C., came the word of the Lord to Zechariah, the son of Berichai, the son of Idu, the prophet, saying, I saw by night. Now, here's a vision. And this book actually has ten visions in it that were given to Zechariah. It says, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he said, Hi, O silver. No, no, that would have been a white horse, right? So he was riding upon a red horse. 
And I stood among the myrtle trees, and there were in the bottom and behind him were their red horses, speckled horses. And, and uh, that Hebrew word speckled, I looked it up right before I, I got here, or what, before I left the house. Speckled is also another form of red, only it's a bright red, according to, uh, according to the Hebrew word there. So he says, red horses, and then really red horses, and white horses. And so, immediately while we're looking at this, we're we're seeing what the prophet is telling us what what he saw. And we're seeing the same thing now in our mind, right? So, here's a man riding upon a red horse. And around him, there's a bunch of red horses and speckled horses and white horses. So, what do we think the man riding on the red horse is. You know what I think it is? A man riding on a red horse. Marlboro man. It could be the Marlboro. I don't think it's a Marlboro man. God doesn't (laughs) really want to encourage us towards towards that. But you can get the red from Marlboro, pack of Marlboro. I think it's, you know, sometimes we complicate the Bible. It's a man on a red horse. And there's a bunch of horses, different horses. I don't think we have to speculate on what does it mean. It's a man riding a red horse. But he's going to further tell us what it is as we go on. But before we go there, I want you to think of this. Remember a guy by the name of Elijah who we studied about? And he left the earth, but he didn't sprout wings and fly. What did he, how did he leave the earth? A fiery chariot, and that fiery chariot was pulled by locomotives, right? Or a Herman Munster, no, it wasn't a car engine. It, there were fire horses. Fiery horses pulling a fiery chariot. But the thing was physical. It wasn't a symbol. He got on the chariot and he left the earth. And it wasn't invisible. It it wasn't an imagination because the other prophet saw it with his eyes. In fact, he dropped his um, mantle. And the other prophet picked him up. And now he had the double. Remember he got the double portion of his spirit because Elijah said if if you see me go up you got your answer you got your wish and what he asked for was that he would have a double portion of the spirit and through our study if you if you can recall he done exactly twice as many miracles as the first guy wow so that's taking god literal right so i think in the spirit world There were all these horses, and these horses are some type of angelic beings that represent, that move really quickly. And it doesn't say they're fire, but a lot of God's spirits are fire. And Jump over to Hebrews, we'll come right back, but jump over to Hebrews chapter 1 verse 13. It says, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? The scripture here says that all of these Ministering spirits were sent forth to minister for us, or to us. In other words, all of heaven is committed. God has dispatched all these ministering spirits in the form of angelic beings to minister to the people who have the covenant. the, The children of God, if you will, in this day, right? Well, it wasn't any different in Israel's day. They had the ministering spirits were in the earth then. 
It says that they're all dispatched. This is actually a really good verse when you're praying and you're counting on, upon God to send forth those spirits. It says, not, it doesn't say are not some of them. You see that? Verse 14 doesn't say are not some of these ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. No, it doesn't say are some of them. It says are not all of them. All of them. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? I think that's what we have pictured here back in Zechariah. Jump back to Zechariah now. Zechariah 1. These are those ministering spirits. The spirits are not only horses, but you saw one guy was riding a horse. Well, why do you, I mean, let's put this in earthly terms. Why would I want to ride a horse instead of walk or run? Because that horse is quicker. That's right. Right? It's showing that God's forces are out. These are angelic forces going throughout the earth continually. Just like we just read in in Hebrews. Continually to make sure that God's plan is accomplished and that he is continually watching out for those that are his. It was then, back then, it's here now for us as well. We can count on the fact that God loves us. He will never leave us or forsake us even till the end. No matter what that means, no matter... We don't know what the future, the immediate future holds. We, won't, we know what, the, what the, uh, fu- the future way down in the distance holds because we know we're heaven bound. We know even if we're killed on this earth, even if we're put on a pole and burned at a stake, we know we're going to heaven Amen. if we're in Christ. Right? Right? But we don't know what the immediate future is. Everyone's destiny is a little different. You can love God just as much as the other person. And one of you is, is called to give your life for Christ. And the other one doesn't have to. I don't know why God makes his choosing the way he does. But I love the way that Paul described it as being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice. He didn't equate his death and his persecution as being equivalent to what Christ went through. Just the blessed opportunity to have a share in it. And the book of Revelation guarantees us that if you are called to be a martyr for Christ's sake... That's about the highest calling you can get. And I think only there's some people that may not, they may not make it if they were called to do this. So maybe God won't put them through that test. But the martyrs, did, they didn't make it because that they, they were invulnerable. They made it because God took up the slack inside them. God's spirit manifested himself in power, gave them the strength and the courage and the will to stand. Having done all, like the scripture, having done all to do, stand therefore. You may see that happen in the near future. As we've already spoke about. Things are getting worse and worse. We are called to live a lifetime of sacrifice. I'm not, uh, I think I'd rather try to live the life than to, to be the martyr. But. <laughs> what is it, 15 seconds of fame? But I'll tell you what, that, Remember, that crown. we all live for eternity. So God's really <laughs> calling you to do that. You're still going to be with eternity. With the and for eternity, you will have that crown of the martyr. Remember, not everybody's going to get the same thing. Not if you're, you, we're all, if we can all be saved, washed into blood, glorified, sanctified, glorified, justified, right? Resurrected children of God. But it doesn't mean we're all going to get the same crowns, the same rewards. We get different 
And next time you want to think about what you're willing to sacrifice by not obeying God to what he's telling you personally to do, think about what you're losing. Think about what it would mean at that day when God hands out the rewards and instead of five crowns, you got four. And that's eternal. And for the rest of your life forever and ever and ever, you're missing out on what you could have had. Because of what? Because of some sin? Because of maybe a little pleasure that you didn't repent of? Or, you know, and I don't, I don't know what it is. I, I don't even know why we're on this subject. But just think of what we're sacrificing when we don't live the way God has called us to live. Amen. So back to Zechariah chapter uh, 1 verse uh, 8. He says, I saw by night a man, or behold, a man riding upon a red horse. I said, I think it's, a, it's not really um, so much symbols. that It is a red horse and it is a man. And he stood among the myrtle trees. In other words, he must have got off the horse and stood on his feet. He stood by the myrtle trees that were in the bottom and behind him were their red horses speckled and white. And then said, I, O oh Lord, this is the prophet uh, Zechariah talking, Oh my Lord, what are these? So he didn't really know what he was looking at. And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And this reminds me, we were talking a little bit about the book of Daniel a little while ago. And it just kind of reminds me of the book of Daniel here. Because remember, Daniel was, was praying to understand the things that God was showing him. And the things that uh, God talked about the, um, about the prophecy of Jeremiah and understanding the 70 years. And God sent Gabriel to him. Do you remember that? He sent an angel, not, not just any angel. He sent Gabriel, who's, I think Gabriel's probably pretty important. I don't believe he's an archangel. I believe there's one archangel. The only one is named in the Bible, and that's Michael. I don't think they're the same. Michael seems to be some type of military general, whereas Gabriel is evidently a favored uh, uh, deliverer of, of the message because he's the one that was sent to Mary as well. The angel talked to Zechariah. So there's an angel that's manifesting himself to Zechariah. Maybe just in the vision. He's part of the vision. So this vision is not only pictures, but someone in the vision is talking to him. An angel. He knows it's an angel of God. Do these things happen today? I think so. I don't think that God sends angels necessarily to, to try to um, tell us like... Um, in fact, I, I heard this one guy say this one time that uh, when you get up in the morning, you should pray before you put on your tie. Of course, this was a church where we wore ties. What color tie you should wear? What color tie would the Holy Spirit wear, want you to wear? Because you may be wearing a green shirt and today he wants you to wear a pink tie with that green shirt. I thought that was pretty stupid myself. God doesn't, I don't think God really cares what tie you wear with your shirt. You know, I, I, I hopefully don't think he's telling you to have a striped tie with a check shirt. You know. But as far as understanding... Zechariah is asking the the angel was sent to help Zechariah understand what this vision represented. What was God trying to say? I don't think there's anything wrong or in fact, I think you're justified if you're trying to understand the scripture because we are not it's not a matter of you just come and listen to me. The Bible says all of us study, te test, what the, t test what the teacher says, test the, test the prophets, test the spirits. How do you do that? You test with the word. God gave you the Holy Spirit. Right? And you test with the word. And in other places in Acts, it talks about being like the Berean Christians. Where they went home to see 
if what the, what the guy behind the pulpit actually was saying the truth. That's what we're individually called to be responsible. In fact, there is a scripture that says, work out your own salvation. salvation. Right? Study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing uh, the word of truth. Yes. These are responsibilities. Anyway, my point was, so God gave you that responsibility. So if you need help, you see, you, you listen to the teachers, but you, if you're confused, God may send an angel. You tell, you tell God, say, God, I am expected to be responsible for understanding this. You've given me the Holy Spirit. Now, whatever you have to do to help me to open up my eyes and my ears and my heart, I'm expect. even if you have to send an angel from heaven. Now, I'm not expecting him to manifest himself and have a bowl of Cheerios with you in the morning. But it may, it may come in a dream. You may be, you know, you may be dreaming that night and all of a sudden... In the dream, somebody's talking to you about this, the relevance of this scripture. So verse 9 does say, Oh Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. Hmm. Isn't that what we were just talking about? The angels being sent and dispatched throughout the earth? That's exactly what he says. He said, these are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. Who's that? Those are those horses and the men that are riding the horses. Now, I'm, I'm saying there's probably men riding those horses because we, we saw one in particular, right? Riding the horse. I think that you don't have to say it's a symbol. I think it's literal that there's there's men, there's angelic beings that are riding angelic horses, speeding throughout the earth. Did you know angels must move at least at the speed of light, or we would see them. You know how fast the speed of light is? One hundred eighty-six thousand miles a second. Now, what that means, that don't mean a lot to us. But, you know, you, you, you all seen the picture of the earth, right? You got, you got the equator. You got, you know, the earth circle, right? To circle the earth, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times... In a second. That's how fast these angels can move. That's 186,000 miles a second. That's the speed of light. Now they may move faster than the speed of light. But we know that they at least move that fast. That, mean, that, that, that means when you're, let's say somebody pushed you off the cliff... And you open your mouth, and you cry out to God before the word Jesus comes out of your mouth. An angel's already been dispatched and ready to catch you. Because God knows the intent of your heart. He knows that you're, you, you, what you're doing. Now, you're, he still wants you to pray that prayer. But have you ever prayed a, a prayer? That, do you think you're going to have to say the, the whole hour, Father, before God's going to have the angel catch you? When you're, you're falling off a cliff, if you're going to wait to say the Our Father, you're going to hit the ground before you finish. Especially if you don't remember the words. And I, I'll tell you right, don't, don't choose the hey word, uh, Hail Mary instead of the Our Father. If you're going to do one or the other, I would go with the Our Father myself. Okay, so... Verse 12, then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast indignation or had indignation these three score and ten years? How much is three score and ten years? Seventy years. Seventy, right? 
Hmm, I wonder where these 70 years came from. Well, remember Babylon was to rule for how many years? Seven. 70 years. That was the judgment. Okay, and we can see that in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. I'll just read this. I got this scripture right here, so we're not going to turn to it. But Jeremiah 29.10, just for your notes, if you're taking notes. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Remember, they were taken captive. So that's where the 70 years came from the prophet Jeremiah. Well, it's interesting if you, if you zip over, and you, again, you don't have to, but if you go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, Daniel was concerned about the 70 years too. Right. It says in, in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So he's quoting about the, the, uh, the very scripture we just got through reading in Jeremiah. And you, you can see how these, these prophets, these prophecies are all interlinked. They're all talking about the same 70 years. In fact, Daniel expands upon it in that same chapter, if you drop all the way down to verse 24. This one you should turn to. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Just so you can see this with your own eyes. In fact, when you get to Daniel 9, they give you a chance to see the uh, verse 2 is where that other one came about, uh, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jer Jer Jerusalem. But if we go down to Daniel 9, verse uh, 21, let's go to 21. Daniel says, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, remember we were just talking about this, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. I wish Gabriel would just swing by and touch me once in a while. How about it, Pastor? Yeah. Wouldn't you just like to... You know, even if he... You know, even if he came... You know how the bully used to come behind you and do the back of your ear. If it was Gabriel, I wouldn't mind. Just to be say, just to tell you that I was touched by an angel. Yeah. They used to have a, mo a series like that, touched by an angel. Don't recommend it. It's not really biblical. <laughs> yes, that's who it was. Yeah. Verse 22, he said, And he informed me and talked with me, this angel Gabriel's talking to Daniel, and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Just like if you are asking, God may send you an angel. Your own little angel. I've heard of he may, he won't, his name may not be Gabriel, it may be Gabriel or Goober. <laughs> I'd rather have Goober than Gomer. <laughs> shazam, shazam, shazam. But uh, verse 23, I got to get rid of that uh, those demons out of me, right? At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. He's going to take these 70 years. Watch, watch, watch. He's, God is going to expand the prophecy right here. There's 70 years, but he says it also represents something else. Because that's what Daniel was trying to find out about the 70 years, right? Because mm -hmm. he was in Babylon. He was waiting to go. When are we going to go back? That's what, in Zechariah, that's what we read about. That's, that's what they said. That's what he, the, they were saying. When, 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 when's the 70 years going to be fulfilled? But the Gabriel says to Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. Now, that is a little misleading if you're not, if you're not aware of it. But watch your translations again, because the King James says 70 weeks because it's trying to convey to you 
What it says in the Hebrew, the Hebrews doesn't say 70 weeks. The Hebrew says 70 sevens. 70 sevens are determined upon thy people and upon the Holy City. Now, anybody got a calculator? Maybe on their phone? No. Somebody do a calculation. What, what is 70 sevens? 49 is 7 times 7. 490. What he's saying is 490 times are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. Well, wait, whoa, whoa. When did God finish? When did he settle the, the whole transgression thing? At the, cross. At the cross. When did he make an end of sins? He has been, yeah. well, At the cross. At the cross yeah. Right? I mean, 2,000 years ago, he took care of it. The fact that I still sin, that's just God, I'm a sinner. But when I confess my sin before him, he takes that sin and puts it back on the cross 2,000 years ago. And he cleans him, cleans me in his blood, doesn't he? He says this 490 times or periods are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. When did he do that? At the cross. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. When did he bring in everlasting righteousness? At the cross. And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Well, I think Jesus was anointed to be the most holy. I mean, in the, if you look at the, remember the tabernacle, you had the, the holy place and the most holy place. But the most holy person that was anointed was the high priest that went into the most holy place, Right? And where did Jesus go when he left? That's why the curtain is torn. That's why the curtain is torn. Because Jesus went, sent it up to heaven. There is, no, there is no block now between us and Christ, if we're in Christ. But he went and he sat down at the right hand of the Father to become the high priest. So the, the anointing of the most holy is the anointing of Jesus in his high priestly ministry. The only thing that... Here is to seal up the vision and the prophecy. That hasn't been done yet. Because it's interesting, if you follow the time period of this 490 years that he's talking about here, it's 483 years till Christ. Uh, uh, till Christ's uh, crucifixion. What's 490 and you subtract 483? Seven years are are left. 483 were completed at the cross. Seven years remained. God put kind of a gap. Anybody ever heard of gap? The gaps in Scripture. There's there's like, uh, I don't know, there's like like 21 different places in the Scripture where there's a gap in prophecy. And it's purposely done. And here, there's a gap of seven years. When do you think that seven years is going to be, like he says here, um, to seal up the vision and the prophecy? When's that seven-year period that remains going to be done? It's that seven-year period of tribulation, right? And then... It ends with Christ coming back. It begins with us going up. At least those of us who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, which, you know, I, I, don't, I don't discount the mid-trib. You want to believe in the mid-trib? I believe with you because I see a mid-trib. And if for some reason I missed the first one, you better know that I'm waiting for the second one. And I even see a third one. And even if I miss the second one, I'm looking for the third one. Because doggone it, 
I ain't going down there. <laughs> I've, I've seen what, what he described. That Remember that rich man? In fact, you brought it up. The rich man was in hell begging for a drop of water. Put on his tongue. Mm-mm-mm. I don't want to go there. Well, good, Brother Jay. Keep waiting. Because hell hasn't come yet. Mm. That seven year period that has that's the only thing that's remaining here. And then he says, This is where he gives us the key. He says in, in verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven sevens. That's forty nine. So forty nine years. And add add to that three score in two weeks. How much is that? Sixty-two sevens, right? Mm-hmm. So if you add all that up, it comes up to four hundred eighty, I think, eighty-three. It says uh, the the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troubles times, and after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. When 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 was he cut off? When was Messiah cut off? After sixty-two weeks. Yeah, but wh- wh- when? What 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 was the date? Well, whenever the crucifixion happened, yeah. right? Because, and literally, what that what the Hebrew word means, cut off, mm-hmm. is the life snuffed out of them. Okay. It means Christ will be killed. I don't understand the, the Jews today that say, "Well, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere, no more in the Old Testament does it talk about the Messiah." being cut off. <laughs> it's right here. This is there. This is the same book they're looking at. That's like if you read Isaiah chapter 53 which talks about anyone anyone that has the spirit of God can see it's talking about Jesus giving his life for us. That's where it says, by his stripes ye are healed. The Jews say, well, that, nowhere does it talk about the Messiah being beaten and bruised. And Somebody is lying to those people in their Jewish synagogues or whatever. I guess they call them synagogues today. The leaders are misleading them. The people have the book in front of them, but their leaders never take them there because they don't. They try to steer them away from these prof- prophecies that they can't, they really can't answer. Like this one here, your Messiah is going to be cut off. It says. So no, no it says uh, verse twenty-five. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. The immediate fulfillment: the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Remember, there, Jerusalem was a desolation. They were taking captivity of Babylon. You couldn't even come back. You, you read in Nehemiah and Ezra, when they're talked about coming back in, to rebuild Jerusalem after that Babylonian captivity, they couldn't even ride a horse down the, the, the city. There, was, there were big old rocks all over. The horse couldn't even walk through it. All that had to be cleared away, and they didn't have tractors. It all had to be done by hand. But the scripture says that the streets shall be built again, the wall, even in troublous times. What is the troublous times referring to? Well, the trouble, you remember when they were clearing that out, they had to hold on to a spear. Work with one hand, fight with the other hand. How would you like to have to go to work, but have to have a sword, you know, defending yourself from the enemy while you're trying to do your job? Maybe you should realize when you're sitting there doing your job, you're also being attacked by the enemy in the spirit world. After three score and two weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. What? 
there's another key about Jesus being cut off. He wasn't cut off because of his own sin, was he? Not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who destroyed the city and the sanctuary after Jesus was crucified? Rome. They were after the gold. They were after the gold in Nebuchadnezzar's day, and they were after the gold in in, uh, 70 AD, weren't they? And now they have it all. And that gold went somewhere. And uh, somebody tells us that it's in uh, the, the vaults of the Vatican. I don't know if it's true or not. And, the, and it, supposedly, it, it, uh, that's what the real meaning of the crusade, the real reason for the crusades, was the, the Vatican wanted all that gold. And so they sent those, the crusaders there to bring back the gold. Supposedly, it uh, that was the success. You know, sometimes you'll hear, uh, you know, you'll hear preachers talk about how the Christians were no better than the Muslims are today. The Muslims will cut your head off today in the name of Allah, but the church did the same thing during the Crusades. No, the church didn't do it. The Catholic Church did it. I was taught that in the beginning there was only one church. And that was the Catholic Church. But that wasn't true. In the beginning there was many churches. If you study history, there were all different kinds of churches. That was the beginning. There were so many differences of opinion. Why? Because Christianity was in its infancy. Plus... You had a problem back then. You didn't have a Bible, not a New Testament. And you had all these guys writing these fake gospels and the, what they call the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha. And Pseude meaning pseudo, using a pseudo, pseudo name. You've heard of, uh, uh, there was that movie about with... Um, Tom Hanks about Mary Magdalene. What was that called? Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code. And that was all about some apocryphal writing of the, of the, the gospel according to Mary Magdalene or something. Saying, well, that was a lost book. For some reason, it didn't end up in the Bible. You know why? It didn't belong there. None of those books that didn't get in there belong there. And don't you think that God is giving you, calling you to, to, to find a, the missing book and put it in the Bible? Because I'll tell you what, when I read, do not add to my words or take away to my... I'm not going to put anything in there. I am not going to tell you that this book, this other book belongs in the Bible. Because my Bible says... In fact... You know, some people will tell you, you know what I'm talking about in the book of Revelation, right? It says, don't, the last chapter, almost the last verse says, don't add or take away or God will add all these plagues to you, right? And people say, oh, you know, he was just talking about don't add or, or take away from the book of Revelation. Three times in the Bible, in, in the law, The writings of Moses, it said, don't add or take away from his word. In the prophets, it says, don't do it. I I don't know if it was the Psalms or or in in, uh, one of the Isaiah, the prophet or something. It said, don't add or take away. And then later on in the book of Revelation, the very last chapter of the volume of the book, it says, don't add or take away. And yet, you know, a brother brought up about some of these new translations. You know what they're doing? Why do they have footnotes to say, they're deleting verses saying, well, this wasn't in the original. Wait a minute, it's in my Bible. So if you're taking it out and putting a footnote and telling me it doesn't belong there, you have just removed words from the Bible. And this, I, I tell you what, this Bible that I have has been around for 400, over 400 years. And it's still working. People are still getting saved off it. 
I'll stick to the, the one that they're not messing with. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that, that, that uh, uh, there's some, there can be some good trans, English translation come out of some of these chapters, but all in all in all, there is a conspiracy going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Satan is working his work, trying to get you to trust this or to trust that. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that uh, the King James is the only way to go. I don't even have to mention King James. I'm talking about the Greek sources. Do you realize that there's one set of Greek manuscripts that the King James was, was translated out of? And then there's these other ones that they say are the, the better ones? that the newer translations are using. And guess, guess who's in charge of it all? The Jesuits. Did you know that the Catholic Church and most of the major denominations all came together and the Bible publishing company so that every Bible translation now uses those, tra those manuscripts that they approve. They, they say these are the best ones. And they, that's why they say the King James just throw away because it's, it's based upon the wrong manuscripts. I'll stick with mine. I'll stick with... You know, I'll go with the King James. You go with whatever you think is right. And we'll see when we get up there, if you get up there. Because I'm, you know, I'm sticking to something that for 400, over 400 years... Some of the greatest preachers in our history. And you know, you might say, oh, you can't listen to those preachers. A hundred years ago, they, you know, a hundred years have passed. <laughs> you know what? You go back and listen to someone who was preaching a hundred years, two hundred years, three hundred years ago. It sounds like they're, they're preaching to this generation. They, they were dealing with the same sin, the same falling away. They were, they were preaching hard and rough. And they weren't twisting the scriptures like they do today. There is so much everywhere you go. There's delusion, delusion, deception, deception everywhere you turn. And it's up to us to be Bereans. Our generation is actually delivered, delivering the most watered down. Christians. Absolutely. In fact, the latest one that, uh, you know, they want me to fall in love with. Is called the Queen James. Have you ever heard of that one? <laughs> Queen James. <laughs> it's been altered to not offend the transgender community. It's called the Queen James. Historically, it's not a coincidence that England was the major, the, the greatest empire ever. The UK had a quarter, they, they ruled over a quarter of the earth at one time. And you know, they were, the fine, they were like the final empire. God blessed them. And the reason he raised them into power was because it was the English and World War I that brought back the land of Israel from the Muslims. And if you trace the, the royal throne of England, the genealogy goes right back to David. Now, that's all I'm going to say about that. I mean, I'm not going to get into that whole thing about the British Israelism because I don't know where, you, where you'll end up. You don't need to, to fool around with that stuff. You got the word of God here, right? Come on. Come on. They'll take you on a trip. Come on, take us there. You'll never come back. <laughs> You'll never come back from that trip if you get involved with that. <laughs> That's right. Three what? Lots of learning. And so we're still... It says uh, in verse 26 here, Daniel 9, 26. How do we get into Daniel? And the end thereof shall be with a flood. Now remember, that can't be a worldwide flood because God said he will never destroy the earth again with a worldwide flood like he did before. That doesn't mean he's not going to destroy the earth. In fact, I would rather be with the flood because he says he's going to use fire. And that fire is a little, stings a little more than that water did. 
at least when you were drowning, you know, and you gave up your last breath. But when you're baptized in a blazing fire, that's no fun. Anyway, there's going to be some sort of fun flood. Well, where do we see that flood? If you go to Revelation chapter 12, it says that Israel... After Satan is fall, comes down to the earth, says the Israel, as the woman, goes out into the wilderness, and the enemy comes after her like a, a flood. It says a flood comes out of the dragon's mouth to try to kill the woman as she runs into the wilderness. Now, what I believe that is, this is not Revelation class, but I believe that's the uh, the Israelites at that time who believe the two witnesses, and they're fleeing to that city of Petra, which has been a place prepared by God for them to be protected for three and a half years. And if you've ever seen pictures of that, that's a, it's an awesome hideout. People used to live there. It's, 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 uh, it's uh, a whole city that was carved out of stone. And people are going to be preserved there. And it says, Unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Oh, wait a minute. What? One? One week. That's one seven, right? Where are you reading that? Uh, verse 27, 927. He shall... The, 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 it talked about the... Uh, Remember in verse 26 in context, the prince that shall come to destroy the city and the sanctuary? Now in Jesus' day, that was Rome. Right? Well, I'll give you a clue. Daniel only mentioned four beasts, and the fourth one was Rome. And after that, he talked about, he put it in a, in fact, we, we can, uh, we're not going to get there today, but we might go there next week. Um, there was uh, there was an image if you if you're familiar with Dan the Nebuchadnezzar's image, and you had the the head of the image represented one kingdom and and the chest another and it, there was the four kingdoms represented, and the last the last kingdom to come was the stone which would strike the image and collapse it, and that was the kingdom of God, and so. Where it talks about here, where it says, uh, it says, he shall confirm the covenant for seven, or, or for one sevens, that's seven years. That's that missing seven years that we had from, remember, we had seven years left over. That's the seven years in the future tribulation. Don't let anybody tell you there's not seven years of tribulation. There's seven years because there's confirmation of the covenant by the Antichrist. The, we know it's, it, it's the person who shall come to destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's the Antichrist. He shall cause the, uh, in, in, in the middle of the week. So he's, he's going to make a, con, uh, a confirm a covenant with Israel for seven years, but in the middle, 42 months... Isn't it interesting that Revelation talks about the seven years and then splits it into 42 months and 42 months? It says it like this, 42 months and 1260 days. Which is 42 months. There's two different periods. There's a period when the Antichrist is there to make the covenant, but he doesn't really become the Antichrist per se until the middle of the tribulation. Now, I personally believe, you, you, you know where it talks about the one head on the beast being wounded? Now, I believe that is symbolic of, of, of some things, but one of the things that it is, is that the, is telling us is the Antichrist is actually going to receive a mortal wound himself. Because when, when he comes to kill the two witnesses, we know it's the Antichrist coming. But it, it says, it doesn't call him the Antichrist. It, it says, the one who ascended from the bottomless pit, whose name was Abaddon, in chapter 9 of Revelation. 
Well, how, how did that spirit get inside him? I believe he died and then was raised from the dead. And now it, uh, it talks about the Antichrist being um, making that covenant. And then 42 months later, he's a, I believe he's assassinated. Somebody tries to kill him. But he comes back to life. Let's read this verse 25. Now, know therefore and understand that from going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again. The wall, even in troublous times, after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come, it's the Antichrist, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. How's he going to destroy the sanctuary? The sanctuary is that they're referring to here is the temple. Remember in Thessalonians, it talks about the Antichrist going into the temple and proclaiming himself to be God. Where's the temple today in, in, in Israel? It doesn't exist, does it? In other words, it's got to be built before the Antichrist can reveal who he is. That third, that third temple is going to be built, and it's going to be built in your lifetime. It's coming. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the middle of the week, this is after he's assassinated, he rises from the dead. God showed me something years ago that said, if you want to understand Satan, all you have to look at is, you know know the scripture when Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 14, and and it has um, Lucifer, and he has his five I wills. I will be like God. I will sit on my throne above the stars of God. You know what I'm talking about? And God's Spirit revealed to me, he says, Satan always tries to pattern and copy off of Christ. That's why if, if, you, if you believe in the, in the baptism of the Holy Ghost and gifts, you can rest assured there are counterfeits out there too. If you believe in miracles, there's counterfeits out there. If you believe in a Bible, there's counterfeit Bibles out there. Amen. Satan always counterfeits. Well, there's a satanic Bible, but that, that's almost, that doesn't really, that only deceives pretty dumb people because if you have a satanic Bible, you got to be dumb to pick that up, right? In fact, years ago, years ago, I walked into a bookstore. Witches and Warlocks. Walked into a bookstore when they had bookstores and all the malls used to have bookstores. Remember that? I walked in there and there was this, uh, they used to have a place where it said occult books. Then they changed, you know, you know what they changed it to? So it didn't say occult? Spiritual. Huh? Spiritual. New age. Well, spiritual, New and age. then they come up, spiritual. new age or spiritual, right? That's the, it's still the same thing. When you saw the word occult, you know you were going to the devil, right? Everybody knew that. And so you went, I went over there, and I picked up the satanic Bible, and I was started reading it. And my wife hollered at me. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know why I was attracted to it. You got to be careful, though. It's not oh, yeah. that, that you're not like justifying what you're doing. Like the guy who you remember years ago where they had the Playboy books and, and you'd go to somebody's house and they say, well, I, I don't look at the pictures. I only read the articles. <laughs> remember that? That's a nice pair of there's a nice <laughs> pair of articles there. Yeah. <laughs> but I understand fully what you're saying. Understand the, and, and this is what the Spirit of God told me. If you want to understand the enemy's tactics, look at Jesus. Because he's going to copy. He's going to copycat what Jesus did. And what main thing did Jesus do? He died and rose from the dead. Antichrist is going to copy that and people are going to worship him. Because 
Who else have we seen rise from the dead? Most of the world don't believe Jesus did. The whole Muslim world says Jesus was a, a great man and a prophet of God, but he didn't die on the cross and rise from the dead. But if, if Jesus did miracles, I will bet you, you're going to see miracles in the, if you were here in the tribulation. You're going to see miracles coming from the Antichrist. Do you think about if you were going to counterfeit a hundred dollar bill, would you put your own would you, would you put your own picture on it? <laughs> You'd put the picture of the same guy that's on there now. Who is it? I don't I don't get very many of them. So who's on the hundred dollar bill? What? You want your present? Franklin. Franklin. What's he doing on there? Brother Franklin. What's he doing on there? Lincoln. Does he help? I remember that game had an Art Link letter on it. $100 kite. $100 kite. No, because he was smarter than most presidents. But if, if, you were, if you were going to counterfeit, though, you would make it to look exactly the same, right? In fact, what they do is they try to get, they have, uh, try to steal plates that they, the government actually uses. Let's say I made it out of note pa- you know, notebook pa- paper with the lines. And so I gave you a hundred dollar bill that I, I printed off on one of those pieces of paper. And you're looking at it and you're like, this is notebook paper. Would you take it as a hundred dollar right. bill? Tellers in the bank, they can often tell by feeling it and looking at it. And there's all kinds of safety things. But the point is, if you're going to do a counterfeit, you're going to make it look real. And when Satan does things to counterfeit, He's going to make it look real. That's why so many people are deceived, because he makes it look real. Question for you, where did Jesus, where did the power that, that Jesus manifested as he walked on the earth, where did he get that power from? From the Father. From the Father, and the Father sitting on the throne. Antichrist is going to copy, watch this, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 13 where the Antichrist gets his power. From oh, the th- dragon. The from the dragon. Right from the dragon. So he shall cause, says about this Antichrist in verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the middle of the week he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblation to cease. How are they going to offer up sacrifices and oblations without a temple? Again, the temple has to be rebuilt. There are, there are hordes. There are thousands upon, multiplied thousands upon thousands of churches that say Israel, God's done with Israel. How, how's this going to happen? Well, they don't expect it to happen. Most of them are amillennialists. They don't believe in any of this stuff, this future prophecy. You got to be careful who you're listening to. But if you, if you just, if you simply read the scripture and believe it, for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. It, it means what it says.